It was a shade tree mechanic. Y'all know what a shade tree mechanic is? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. This guy was a shade tree mechanic, and Jesus had marvelously saved him, and he was so excited. Came to prayer meeting on Wednesday night, and so the pastor said, Do we have any testimony? And nobody said a word. Finally, the pastor said, Well, you were just saying. And he said, Do you have any word for us? He said, Yeah, I do. And he stood up and he said, Whoopee, preacher, I feel just like I had my vows ground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of how I feel this morning is the fact that I, I'm, I'm excited about being a part of the family and I hope I don't disgrace the family. Uh, I've been privileged to. Uh, to be in, uh, in some different places, and we can talk about that later. Uh, but uh, one of my favorite stories is the story of the young man who was called to his college town church where he went to college. And so he thought, oh man, I can't go there. He said, God, you made a mistake. He said, well, okay. So he wrote home to his dad said, Dad, if I preach about science, my chemistry and biology professor are going to be sitting there. They're going to nail me. Mm. If I say the wrong words, my English professor is going to be there and she and he are going to nail me. And, and Dad, if I say anything about anything one of those professors at the school they all go to that church and they're going to nail me if I miss it up mm. a few days later the young man received the letter back from his father and the father said son tell them about Jesus they won't know anything at all <laughs> <laughs> so what I want to do today I, I just want to share with you a, a, in fact the Lord told me to to preach this sermon because I, I wanted to and and he said go for it I had another one already picked out and he just said, kept saying no I want you to go there so for some reason all of us need to hear it, and I need to hear it, okay because what the title of it is and and as I used to tell students that I was teaching uh, most of whom were preachers I would say now guys this will preach so if you want to copy the outline, you can. Okay. You probably won't, but you, you have better sources. <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. In the 16th chapter of the, of the book of 1 Samuel, there's an interesting passage there, and uh, it's about the anointing of David as king. Now, you got to remember now, this is when David's just a kid. Okay? And so consequently... The Lord said to Samuel, how long are you going to grieve about Saul? Saul Saul's messed up, and uh, he decided he liked the sheep and the goats and the belly aches and all the other stuff that went with the other, with, with Amalek and all that kind of thing. And so consequently, the Lord said, uh, I don't mean anything by it. Samuel went to see Saul, and Saul said, oh, I've taken care of everything God wanted me to take care of. Doesn't that sound like some of our people, even us, sometimes? Mm -hmm. Oh, God, I'm not taking care of it. Well, uh, Samuel said, I don't mean anything by it, but what does the lowing of the cattle and the blading of the sheep mean? You, God told me and God told you that you were supposed to kill every man, woman, child, mm. sheep, camels, goats, all that stuff. Now, I don't mean anything about it. Well, let me explain to you. You know, we're good at explaining things when we're disobedient to God. Have you ever noticed that? We're, we're really good. We can try to explain our way out. Even as Christians, we try to explain our way out. But consequently, <coughs> David said, I mean, Saul lost his, his kingdom and the Lord said to Samuel, well, how long are you going to grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? So fill your horn with oil. 
Get on with life. Get on with life. And then, he said, fill your horn with oil, so go and I will send you to Jesse and the Methylamite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Mm -hmm. Now, y'all are familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what shall, what you shall do. And you'll anoint for me him who is, I declare to you. And Samuel did what the Lord had commanded and went to Bethlehem. And then if you drop all the way down, we see in verse 10 that Jesse had all these boys, and he paraded them in mm -hmm. and said, look here, look here, look here, look here. And he had, he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and beautiful eyes and was handsome. Bethany and all of you ladies, that listen to this. He was handsome, had beautiful eyes, was handsome, and arise and anoint him for this is he. Mm -hmm. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed. I like that word. Rushed to get on him. Upon David. From the day, from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went back to Rome. Now, that's that's the picture I want you to see. Okay? Now David's just a kid. Probably. 13, 14, 15. Who's the Old Testament guru in here? Huh? Who, who's the Old Testament? Okay. How old was David? <laughs> See, I'll just ask him ahead of time so I won't embarrass myself. Huh? How old was he when he was Yeah, born? how old? Yeah. Right. Still a teenager. Still a teenager, right? Okay, now the question I want to ask you is this, and this is what I want you to want us to look at very quickly today. Okay? Is that clock right? It's right. Okay. It's All right. right. Well, I don't pay any attention. I just like to know they're right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. No. He was about 15 years old, 16. He's just been anointed as the king of Israel. Can you imagine that? That's kind of like winning the lottery. That's, that's kind of like being elected president of the United States. That's, that, that's how big that was. Okay? But now wait a minute. Saul was still at the castle. Saul was still in, in, in charge. Saul still had the keys to the, to the men's restroom. <laughs> All that kind of thing. Saul was still in control. But David had been anointed as the king. Mm -hmm. Now what are we doing? Is David supposed to go to Saul and say, <clears throat> Saul, uh, I hate to tell you this, but yeah. God told me I'm the new man. <laughs> I'm the new boss here. Uh -huh. <laughs> no. No. What did David do? He went back, back to the field to take care of the sheep. He went back out to take care of the sheep. What his daddy told him to do? Go back and take care of the sheep. In the meantime, in the in-between time, what are you going to do? Several years ago, I drove into the driveway of my mother's home and her, her husband, because they, he, he had married her after my father had passed away and his wife had passed away. They got married and... We, I was driving down there. I had a wedding to do in that community, and I drove in the driveway, and just as I drove in the driveway, the lady next door screamed, I think he died. Hmm. Meaning, my stepfather had been out in the garden, was working, and he died. Hmm. In the meantime, in the in-between time, what are you going to do? We called an ambulance, but the ambulance didn't come for about 10 minutes. The EMTs didn't come for about 10 minutes. In the meantime, and in the in-between time, what are you going to do? Well, we went out in the garden. We tried to work with Bob and tried to revive him, and there was nothing there. 
after the 10 minute of the layover, they picked him up. Then they swept him away, and I picked up my mother, and we went to the hospital to find out what all was going on. In the meantime, and the in the in between time, what are you going to do? And you say, well, David was caught in that in between time. In the meantime, and in the in between time, what are you going to do? I'm so glad God has a plan for all of us. You say, well, why would God anoint a 15, 16 year old kid to be the king of Israel when he already had one on the throne? It's because he wanted to train David in some things to get him ready to be the person he wanted David to be and the king that God <coughs> wanted him to be. Now, I ask you, how do you train a king? How do you train a king? Well, let's look real quick. Well, first of all, he told him, he said, David, you've got to go back out and take care of your sheep. Wow. Wait a minute. I just got time out here. I just got anointed. Mm. Mm. His daddy said, so what? The sheep need to be taken care of. But there's a secret there. And I'm going to tell you four things in a little bit about four things that God wanted to build into David's life. I mean, we all know the story of how David took care of the sheep and how he protected the sheep from the, from the wolves and from the coyotes and from the badgers and from all the bobcats and everything else. We also know all of the experiences that, that, that David had. And then God sent a spirit on Saul. And guess what? Saul had... I don't know if he had lumbago or what he had. But anyway, he had a troubled spirit. And the only thing that would soothe him was a harp. Mm. Guess who knew how to play the harp? Oh, my goodness. Huh? Guess who knew how to play the harp? And one of the servants said, Mr. King, uh, we have somebody that can get your lumbago back out of, out of, out of a crisis. Your arthritis is not going to hurt you anymore because we're going to get this guy. And so they brought David in. And who? how do you deal with people? You know how you deal with people? You learn how to deal with people by mm -hmm. dealing with people. Mm -hmm. Right. The other Sunday, I told my wife, I said, I'm not going to church. I got up and I said, I'm not going to church today. I said, I'm fed up. People make fun of me the way I dress. People make fun of me the way I talk. People make fun of me of the way of kind of shoes I wear. People make fun of me and all this other kind of thing. She said, but David, you're the pastor. <laughs> You've got to go. Yeah. And the <clears throat> problem is, you and I, you have to deal with students. Are all of your students A students? Probably not. But what I'm saying is, you still have to deal with them. Because they have family problems. They have special needs. They have special opportunities. All of these things happen. And so consequently, what it amounts to is the fact that David learned the ways of the palace by playing a harp. And as he learned how to play a harp, he also had learned how to get along with angry people. Mm. Now, how many sheep come up to you and say, I don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> See, sheep don't talk that way. At least the sheep I've been around don't talk to me that way. <clears throat> they don't come up to you and say, you're ugly. I don't <laughs> like the shirt you got on. <laughs> she won't do that. But people will. People will. Had a guy tell me one time, he said, where in the world did you get that tie? I said, I bought it at Goodwill. Why? 
Well, he said, I just thought I'd tell you I didn't like it. I said, well, you didn't have to know where I got it. <laughs> you see, there's all kinds of interrelations that were going on. And God loved David enough that he said, let me build this in. 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 Me build this in. Before you're crowned, outwardly the king of Israel. But there was a deeper meaning in all this because I don't know whether you found that verse in the Bible or not, but it says that David loved God with his whole heart and was a man after God's own heart. Now, he messed up. Anybody here ever messed up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, all of us have messed up. If you have it, you're lying. <laughs> I don't know what your other problems are, but that's one thing you need to deal with. Yeah, we've all messed up. And so consequently, what David learned were four things in this whole in this whole thing. And it's the reason why over there in the New Testament it says David loved God with his whole heart and was a man after God's own heart. Mistakes and all. God never quit loving him. I don't think he's ever stopped <clears throat> loving anybody. But he definitely didn't stop loving David. He still planned. He still has a plan for David. Yeah. yeah. Even as we move on through. Okay? The four things I want you to see, and you're going to have to listen real quick in a hurry. All right? There are four things that God built into David's life that I hope, whether I stay here a month, whether I stay here six months or six years or however long I'm here, I hope you'll write this, these down. Because there's four things that God is building into your life and my life every single day. Because in, the, in, in between the time that I got saved, which at one time I was nine years old, Okay? I won't tell you how old I am now. But in the meantime and in the in-between time, what's God training us to do? What's He building into us? I love Romans 8.29. Anybody know what Romans 8.29 says? We know. Everybody knows Romans 8.28. I hate Romans 8.28. No, I don't hate it. I just, I just like Romans 8.29. Because Romans 8.29 says, Whom he did foreknow. Did he know us ahead of time? Mm -hmm. If he didn't, he lied in Psalm 139. God says, Whom he did know ahead of time, he did decide ahead of time that we should be conformed to the only begotten Son of the Father. You know what that means? It means that all of us are being built to look just like Jesus. Right. That's what He's in that. And, and uh, goodness, I wish I, had that, wish I had time to tell that story. Well, I, I'll go ahead and tell it and then, tell then, then the, the president can throw me out later. Okay? No, there's a, there is a statue down in Dallas, Texas. Big statue of horses running through a, a, a big fountain area. And they're made out of marble. They're made out of marble. A guy had to stand and chip and all this kind of thing. Somebody asked him, there's like 14 horses in there, and he had to knock off all that stuff to make, that, to make those horses look real. And the reason I like to use that illustration is because that's exactly what God's Holy Spirit does in your life and my life as He's building us and shaping us into what He wants us to be. Somebody asked that sculptor, said, you've got all this marble out here. And said they brought it in in big chunks. And he said, then they told me that you studied the, the, that, that, that big chunk of marble for six months before you ever picked up your hammer and picked up your chisel. 
we got that right. Why did you wait? Why? He said, because I wanted to sit here and I wanted to look at those big blocks of granite and marble. And he said, I wanted to see every horse hmm. that was inside of that marble. Hmm. And he said, then it was simple. And the fellow said, what do you mean it was simple? He said, it was real simple. He said, I picked up my chisel, I picked up my hammer, I picked up my tools, I went to work. Because he said it was real easy because he said all I had to do was knock off everything that didn't look like those 16 horses that were in that marble. Do you know you and I have a whole lot of stuff in our lives that God's in the process of knocking off that yeah. doesn't look like Him. Yeah. Because yeah. He's building me according to Romans 8, 30, 8 29, that He's conforming me. He's building me. He's shaping me. That's exactly the same thing in the Old Testament that He's saying about David. Hmm. So there's four things. You ready? Number one. David had a passion for God. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. This is, this is what our church, one, one of the things that our church pledges themselves to. Okay? That we have a passion for God. Do you know what it's like to be out on a lonely night and hear a coyote <coughs> yelp? <coughs> and you got about 40 or 50 or 60 sheep out here? Mm -hmm. And you're wondering where he's going to strike because he is going to strike. Yeah. And you begin to pray and you say, Father, I wonder what I should have for dinner tomorrow. Mm. No. No. You say, Lord, I need you more right now than I have ever needed you because there's danger for my sheep. And I need you and I love you and I want you to protect me and I want you to protect my sheep. You see, I need a passion for God, first of all. The second thing I need, I need a passion for people. I need a passion for my sheep. <coughs> I'm interested in my sheep. Some of them black sheep, some of them Hispanic sheep, some of them Anglo sheep. That's what I get to work. That's what God has given to me. It's where your presidents go preaching about four weeks. And so consequently, he gave David a passion for people. Passion for God. Passion for people. Mm -hmm. A passion for serving. You know one of the reasons why David was a friend of God? He was a servant. He would much rather serve than to be served. Mm -hmm. Oh, he blew it. Yeah. Just like we blow it. But he blew it. Nonetheless. But he had a heart to serve. He had a heart to serve. You don't believe that? One of my favorite Old Testament stories is the story of Mephibosheth. Y'all remember that story? Mephibosheth was a 